Each week here at the World Affairs Council, we're, we are reaching out to friends around the world and to see how uh, COVID-19 is really affecting uh, their lives, their families, and, and really their country. And today we're speaking to Nadia Susi. Many of you may remember Nadia. She was an intern at the World Affairs Council in our marketing department, I guess about three or four years ago. And in fact, she even lived in our house uh, she just returned from Tokyo, where she earned her MBA, uh, came back to Tunis with aspirations to start her own business. And you can imagine how the virus has altered those plans. Hey, Nadia, it's great to see you, and thanks for joining us. Hi, Jim, and hi, everybody from the World Affairs Council. It's nice to talk to you all. So, Nadia, tell us what's, what's going on. How's your family? Um, is everyone sheltered in place in, in one house, or are you separated? So my family has been doing pretty well. I live with my father and mother. Both of my brothers have like, uh, they got married and they moved into their houses. So it's basically my parents and I, and they're in their 70s. So for them, if they were to like get this virus, it would be like very bad for them. So I'm trying to be, you know, to support the family, to be the one who goes out for grocery shopping or anything because now the entire country is on lockdown um, and everybody is kind of doing like self-quarantine. So it's really very much advised by the government that we do not get out of our houses. Um, and then uh, starting from 6 p.m., there's actually a curfew and we cannot under any circumstances go out of our houses. Yeah, you used the phrase lockdown. Here we've been saying shelter in place. Does, is lockdown, I guess, more severe? And if so, what are the essential services that, that you're able to go to? Grocery stores, pharmacies, or, or what is it? So I would say it's pretty severe as a lockdown and the government really wants it that way because we are basically not allowed to go out of the house uh, from 6 p.m. onwards. But then from, 9 a, from 6 a.m. in the morning to around 6 p.m., you can actually go out but only like for the really, really necessary things. If you need to go like grocery shopping or if you need to go to the pharmacy or um, if it's something like really, really important, you even have like to have a document in place uh, that is like an authorization to go from one place to another. If it's like going from one specific part of Tunis to another specific like neighborhood of Tunis. I saw something remarkable just a, a few days ago when I was looking at things for our conversation. There's even a robot or a few robots that are going around and <laughs> catching you and asking to see your documentation. Have you run into one of these? Yeah, that is correct. I haven't like seen one of these because I've barely even gone out in the last like three weeks, but these are primarily located in downtown and they're asking like people uh, that they see on the streets, like going about, like what, what are they doing on the streets? Are they going like for something that is very necessary or not? And they ask them for the documents that I uh, told you about, like that authorization for you to have, if you like are planning on going to, from a specific neighborhood in Tunis to another neighborhood. And even like from city to city, for example, if I wanted to go to the city of Sousse, I wouldn't be able to because that's prohibited now, only in extreme, extreme cases. So one of the major differences that we've seen, say, in Tunisia and some other countries uh, compared to the United States is the military is, is actively involved in enforcing the curfew or the lockdown. Uh, and I also read that uh, over a thousand people have actually been put in, in, in jail for violating, the, for violating the lockdown. Yeah, that's like the military is doing an amazing job. They can seem to be a little more severe, to be honest, but it's something that is really needed in the country right now because a lot of people sometimes are not really following the rules. And especially like nowadays, like today, even the Minister of Health was even crying on TV because he was really overwhelmed seeing like people on the streets, like even not, not really doing necessary things. They should be at home, but people have been going out because they're so tired. It's already been like three weeks almost of lockdown. So that the military has to enforce those kind of like measures because if people and sometimes people sometimes unfortunately people are not following the rules they have to enforce them in any way they can have they set a date for when the lockdown will end so 
most people now are saying like around April 20th, uh, but that's not a confirmed date yet. The government is saying that this week is the most important week. And after this week, we'll have a lot more visibility about of like what's gonna happen in the next weeks. But we're very optimistic if everybody stays at home and we don't have as many people as like kind of now, people are starting to go out a little bit. If we can contain those people to not go out anymore, then we're looking, I think, at probably even before April 20th, but it really depends on like how people react. Yeah, but one of the challenges is gonna be when Ramadan starts, what, April 23rd, 24th, something like that? Yeah. And during Ramadan, well, why don't you tell people what happens during Ramadan? I mean, it's truly a time when families get together, isn't it? Yes, so it's, Ramadan is such a like strong point, like throughout the year, everybody's waiting for Ramadan because it's such a spiritual and also like family oriented celebration uh, because after like when we break the fast, everybody gets together and even like when we're having dinner together, some family members or friends might come to your house. So it's a very like sh built around sharing. So I think during this time, we'll have to like think of other ways of celebrating Ramadan. Uh, there's probably like, we don't know if coffee shops and restaurants are gonna be open again. Now they've been closed for almost three weeks. Um, and a lot of people just go to coffee shops uh, after we break the fast. So we, we actually, we don't even know how we're gonna do well, well, Ramadan sure. this year. It's a bit like, you know, the Christmas season, holiday yeah. season here and, and restaurants and our hotels probably earn a significant amount of their income during that, during that, that time. Yeah, that's correct. How do you see this really affecting your own life? I'm sure you've been talking to friends, people your age. Uh, what are their thoughts about the, the future and, and how quickly Tunisia will, will recover? So right now, I have to say like I'm very proud of how Tunisia is handling the situation. We've taken really like preventive actions because we're aware of like if these numbers get like increase a lot, we're not going to be able to handle uh, the situation. So the country was really good at like having really strong preventive actions to be able to not come to like a serious case where we wouldn't be able to like handle this pandemic in Tunisia. When I talk to people that are my age, um, they're very optimistic. There's a lot of like groups that are forming on social media. Like people are st staying at their houses, but they're trying to develop apps. They're trying to help their communities. They're trying to help the hospitals in whichever way they can. So it's a very much um, a solidarity level that is building up in the country. So it's true that we're all in our houses, but we're trying to get online to look for solutions and how to support our government. Nadia, we, I hope you're seeing the photo that's up right now uh, about these wonderful women who uh, started making masks. Tell, tell us about them. I guess they're, they're really being viewed as heroes, aren't they? They are, they're such, like now they're the talk of the country and we're very, very proud of them because they have decided early on just to like come with their luggage, to stay in quarantine in this factory and to still make masks. Th these are people that have left their families at home and they've dedicated their time entirely to making masks for the country. So yeah, it's a big okay. pride in here, yeah. So how is testing going along? Are, are people able to get tests and are the hospitals prepared? I mean, in relative terms, at least if the reports are accurate, Tunisia has not had that many cases. I think just right around 600 cases yes. and what, about 25 or so deaths. So, you know, it, yes. it seems like a, I mean, all day, you don't want any of this, but yeah. I mean, in com comparative terms, it, it could probably be a lot worse. It's true. And it's really thanks to the preventive actions that the government has really put in place really early on. Um, and also for testing, the government has put in place a lot of like websites, apps to find out about the symptoms, to find out about this virus, more information and how to, even if you go out of your house, out of necessity, what are the measures to take to be able to protect yourself? And so testing is really required for people that have like the real strong symptoms. You would go on these websites and answer a lot of questionnaires. And then if they determine that you might have it, then you would be put on, on a call with the 
the relevant person. And if this person really determines that you might be up for a test, then they would call you in and you would go to the hospital to have a test. We have just a, another minute or two, but I want to ask you about what type of safety net uh, has the government been able to provide? Because I think about the thousands of people who work, say, for example, in the hotel industry. Uh, how are they, are, are they getting any type of income? Yeah, even for this matter, the government has done an outstanding job in uh, making sure there's an allowance for these people. Um, so they have put in place like a little bit of money for them to be able to sustain their living while this is going on. So people would go to the post office or uh, they would get their money online for like depending on if you have access to internet or not. Uh, they have put in place like money that they can use to be able to, to live while this is going on. How is the United States being viewed in all this? I mean, we've been reading here about how China has provided a lot of assistance and in a sense, assuming a global leadership role that the United States uh, formerly held. Are, are you feeling that in, in any way in, in, in Tunis? Well, how we view the United States is people are really shocked about the numbers in the US right now. Uh, they're increasing like by enormous amounts. Um, we don't know how, I personally, I can not really speak for the country for this matter, but I don't really understand like how much this is, has amplified in the US and like even more, three times more like than China right now. Um, so we really like wish for, for you guys the best in being able to like contain this. Um, and we really, we wish the best for the whole world because this is something that the whole world is going through. And I think every country doing their best to contain this, like you've seen, this has started in China, but look at, look at it, like it's spread everywhere. It really shows like something started in one side of the world doesn't mean that it's not going to get to you eventually. Well, it truly does show how we're all united. Nadia, you know how much I always love to see you. Thanks so much for, for sharing your thoughts. And, and please give my, my very best uh, uh, to your family. As you know, Tunisia is truly my second home. Take Thank care. you very much, Tim. Thank you. It's Bye. always a pleasure.